Hello, Wendy Dickin. Hi, Dirk. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm very good. Um, so we've known each other for a few years. Just a few. You were uh, our son's uh, voice and piano teacher for maybe a decade? Maybe. maybe. Just about that, yes. Yeah, somewhere close. Doesn't seem like it, but I guess it is. Um, and we're going to talk about you are the, uh, I don't know, proprietor. I don't know. <laughs> Artistic director. Is Artistic, my title. There you go. <laughs> Artistic director of a, uh, uh, is it okay to say it's a small local theater company? It is a, com well, it's a community performing arts organization. Yeah. So we have theater, we have choirs, we do acting classes. So we have a variety of things that all are geared toward performing arts. Okay, so it's all part of the same umbrella then. Right, yeah. Okay. Midwest Center for Creative Arts. The, say it again. You kind of Midwest Center for Creative Arts. Okay, which you abbreviate to MCC, MCCA, and I always get it wrong when I say it out loud. <laughs> That's right. Too many C's, but yeah, MCCA. Okay, so we're going to talk about that today because um, – you know, just because we have a history, and I just I, I think that's a, a f interesting and it's a unique um, organization. You know, most of us are running our nine to fives, and and you're <laughs> kind of running an all day and all night thing. And you know, I've got a history in theater, and my wife does too, so that's it's interesting to us. But let's let's go back in time first. All right. So I know um, because we visited the campus with our son that you graduated from. Miami University in Miami of Ohio. Right, Oxford, Ohio. Oxford, Ohio, sorry, yes. Oxford, Ohio, that's okay. Which, it's a small town, what, hour, hour and a half north of Cincinnati? Just so, about that, yeah. And you literally can only get there on two-lane roads, um, kind of two-lane back roads almost. That is true. It's uh, sort of remote. Yeah, so it's this beautiful, sprawling campus in a tiny little town. Um, so tell me, tell me about that. I mean, you told me that your story about auditioning and your experience there a while back. So go, tell me about that story. Yeah, well, you know, I was very fortunate growing up in Cincinnati. There's so much to do in the arts there. And my mother was a theatrical director and a school teacher. My father was a singer and a school teacher. Um, and they just knew a lot of people. So when I was fairly young, I want to say I was probably about 11 years old, I started working at... Uh, the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music taking lessons. And um, that was great. And it's a phenomenal school. I would highly recommend it to anyone. But by the time I was ready to go to college, I wanted something a little more brick and mortar, not urban. And uh, my mother had taken some continuing education classes at Miami University when I was about 13. And I went with her to all of her classes that summer and fell in love with the campus. Um, a couple of years after that, I studied with somebody who had gone to school there, and she took me back there and introduced me to the professors in the music department, and that just strengthened my bond with that school. So I decided that that's where I was going to audition, and that's where I wanted to go. So very foolishly, I only applied to three schools. But when I did my audition at Miami, it just, it just clicked. Everything was just like a charm. And that ended up being where I spent about five years of my life uh, going through a bachelor's and master's degree in opera performance. And um, so at you, you, one point you said you wanted to go somewhere not urban and, and you kind of emphasize it. What, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Where'd that come from? Um, you know what, if you've ever, and you have been there, but for people who haven't been there, Miami University is full of brick buildings with Georgian columns, green grass, and tons of trees. It is a truly beautiful campus and it does have a fantastic music school. And I, I simply fell in love with the school. Um, and I knew I had looked at also Northwestern University in Chicago, which is also a rather urban campus like the University of Cincinnati, uh, and Westminster Choir College in New Jersey, uh, which seemed pretty far away for a little Ohio girl who was maybe not quite ready to leave the Midwest. So 
um, Miami was just a perfect choice. That's great. Yeah, it kind of reminded me, I went to Kirksville, Missouri, um, and this, it's it's a similar campus up. It's a, it it, is. Yeah, the campus there, half the population of Kirksville is on campus. Yes. And um, you could walk from one side of the campus half an hour maybe, you know, so it's mm -hmm. not, it's not that gigantic, but it's beautiful. The buildings are all gorgeous and old and, and old and new mixed in there. And yeah. So. Right. Um, right. So you graduated with a degree in opera. Is that, is that? I did. My degree is actually in opera performance. And that is what I did for a while. I performed in operas and I did musical theater with professionally. Um, so I was able to do a lot of things. I just was able to make a lot of contacts there and just had some wonderful, wonderful opportunities. Where'd you do the musical theater and opera? Um, well, I had been doing musical theater since I was about four years old, since my mother was involved with um, school and community theaters. And so I had already done a lot of musical theater before I ever got to college. Uh, when I was working on my master's degree at Miami, I was very fortunate to be able to spend quite a bit of that year in New York. And I worked um, with some coaches at the New York Metropolitan Opera at that time. And then I was able to perform with Boris Goldovsky's Young Artists Opera Theater, which was a big deal back in the day. Uh, I actually went to Louisiana with them and performed in Lafayette, Louisiana. And right after that, I ended up getting a job at what was the time, I believe, the only true repertory theater in the country uh, in Big Fork, Montana. So it was a little bit of culture shock going from New York to Montana, but I did, and I am so happy that I did because that experience uh, in Big Fork has colored my entire life and the way that I approach theater and the way that I approach performing. Um, and it has created the culture of my own company and how we have everybody so supportive of each other and happy when somebody gets a great role and not sad if we get a smaller role and just to be part of that uh, production and part of that family. There are no small parts, only small actors. That is what they say. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, um, so my degree is in theater too, and not too, but that's my degree. Um, mm -hmm. That saying, until like five years ago, I thought it applied to how small I am. And I'm not kidding. Oh, no. Because, <laughs> and it really, it really, it's saying, hey, you got a part, be big, mm -hmm. be a big person about it. You know, be a big <laughs> boy, pull your pants up and go do it and do it well. So how long were you in Big Fork? Um, I was in Big Fork. That season lasted about a summer. At that time, they only did a summer season. So I went uh, by train across the country by myself uh, to Whitefish, Montana, where they picked me up and they took me to the theater in Big Fork. Uh, we were there, I wanna say that we were there about two weeks before we started putting up shows. Everything happens uh, in repertory theater very, very quickly. So we put up the first show in a couple of weeks and had started practicing the next show. By the end of the summer, we had, I think, four or five shows going simultaneously and it would switch every other night. We'd be doing a different show. Um, so that, that was that summer. And as that was um, going on, I was also asked to be the director of the Flathead Valley Children's Theater. So I stayed in Montana and uh, directed children's theater. I remember doing Winnie the Pooh, the musical, with them. And um, I also was able to teach college there. So I taught at the Flathead Valley Community College, okay. uh, helping them develop their vocal music program. And I got to work on some other phenomenal things there. Amy Grant, the singer, songwriter, actually filmed her Christmas special there. This was back in the 80s. <laughs> and <laughs> So you so she up her Christmas, <laughs> Christmas special there. And uh, I was very, very young. I was like, you know, 20, 23, maybe 23 years old at the time. And uh, so I got to work on that Christmas special uh, along with the orchestra. And they had uh, the choir there, the Glacier, Glacier Chorale, I think it was called. So that was just a proud moment and lots and lots of fun. 
I also was able to play the role of the mother in the mall and the night visitors when I was out there. And they said, I don't know if this is true or not, I can't really back this up, but they said at that time that that was the first opera ever performed in Northwestern Montana. Oh, wow. We're introducing people to, to some of that culture. Although I will say Northwestern Montana is a very cultured place. It's very artsy, lots of things going on there. And it was just a fascinating, wonderful experience. So how, so how did you go from Montana to St. Charles O'Fallon, Missouri? <laughs> that was a long and winding road. It was quite a journey. Um, I met someone. <laughs> I met a young man in Montana and we fell in love and um, dated for a long while. So wait, was he was he part of the theater and everything, or was he? He separate? was he was not. He okay. just happened to be up there, and uh, he he's the kind of guy that likes to hike and and do all sorts of crazy wilderness things that you can do up there. And uh, so I met him, and he was from St. Louis, uh, but that's not the end of that story. Um, at some point in time, we parted ways. And I had an opportunity to study with a phenomenal voice coach in Chicago. So I actually moved from Montana to Chicago uh, because I'm a fan of culture shock because <laughs> that was definitely culture shock. Uh, and I made a living and did some performing in Chicago and studied uh, with, with this uh, voice teacher out there uh, before moving back to Ohio and then ultimately moving out here to St. Louis. Okay. And what were you doing here in St. Louis at the time? I had gotten married, and that was why I came here. Right. We'll confess that St. Louis had never in my entire life been on my radar. I just <laughs> didn't, think, didn't think too much about that. <laughs> so I just ended up in St. Louis and thought, what am I going to do with myself? While I'm out here, I knew just about no one. Uh, so I ended up teaching at a couple of Montessori schools, teaching some music, um, doing property management, because as you know, artists do just about anything to live while they're trying to pursue their career. And then I started teaching uh, for a studio in Ellisville, uh, piano, voice, and flute, which are my three instruments, and building a studio there, which I had for quite some time before I decided that I was going to move to St. Charles and uh, St. Charles, Missouri and buy a house. And then I ended up teaching out here, which is how we met. Okay. Yeah. Right. So take me to the origins of uh, the MCCAA. Where did it, where did it come from and what was the, <laughs> yeah. What, what was the driving force behind starting that? Well, that I was working uh, with Mozingo music where I still have a studio um, and they were wondering what would be an appropriate way to reach out to the community and do something that they didn't really have going on here yet. And um, that question was posed to me, and I thought about it for about a week, and I went back and talked to Jeff Mozingo, who is the, uh, one of the owners of Mozingo Music, and I said, I think we need to start a theater. I think this is the way that we can reach out to the community. Uh, there were a couple of youth theaters in, around, in and around town. Uh, and then there is another uh, community theater in O'Fallon. But I said, I think there's room for more. And I think we can reach a community that it basically hasn't had that opportunity yet. Um, and it's a really good way to give back to the community. It's just something we can do. And we happen to have all the right people who are qualified to start an organization like that at that time. Um, I believe that at that time in history, that was in 2011, that we were the only community theater or only performing arts organization like that that was directly attached to a music store. And so we were written up in magazines like the National Association of Merchants of Music and all sorts of things. It was very, very exciting. Um, and we were quite successful starting out. Um, the first cast, the first big cast that I really had 
uh, was for the musical Barnum. I don't remember how many people were in that cast. I want to say there were probably 30 or 40 people in it. And we had rehearsals and everybody gelled. We created a real sense of community and people were gaining experience. And part of what we were doing was trying to create resumes for young performers who were getting ready to go to college and major in theater or music or dance. Um, and we had quite a bit of success with that. And I remember the last performance that we gave, everyone said their tearful goodbyes, not knowing when they were gonna see each other again. And we rehearse on Tuesday night. As a matter of fact, in about an hour, we're gonna be starting virtual rehearsals online for another show. I saw that. Yeah, and uh, anyway, so we, we did our last performance, and the next Tuesday I was teaching at the studio, and I walked out of my door at seven o'clock, and lo and behold, the entire cast of Barnum was standing in front of my door, and I said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, we have to be together. We have to do more. So from that point on, we just did shows. We now do, um, instead of one show every term, and we have a three-term year, we usually do four or five. So in the spring term this past year, we were actually working on five separate plays and musicals, um, along with the choirs that we do. And our choirs have now been invited to sing at Carnegie Hall. We've, we've just done some marvelous, marvelous things and had great experiences. Uh, and the dance classes and just everybody wants to be together. And it's kind of got a life of its own at this point. Yeah, you mentioned Barnum. At the only time I did Cattle Call auditions, I sang There's a Sucker Born Every Minute. That is a great song. Yeah. Um, so you you started in 2011, right? Yes. And did you start with that goal in mind of helping kids build up? A, and, and so let me take it back. You're helping kids build a resume. Mm -hmm. um, and are these are these... I think I know the answer, but these are kids that are not going to a traditional school that is this for homeschool kids specifically, or, or kind of just morphed into that, or what's the... Um, no, I will say that at any given point in time, we probably have had between 15 and 20% of our performers are homeschooled. Okay. We welcome them. Um, if, if they want to be part of our group, we love to have them. Um, most of our kiddos, and they're not all kids, we have adults too, so we go from kindergarten through adults. Um, so I will say that most of the kids who participate with us go to public or private school. Some of the private schools don't have dynamic uh, performing arts programs, and so this is just good for them. But also, the ones that do, a lot of our kids do both. So they will do their school programs and they will do things with us as well. Besides having, uh, besides performing, we also have a student mentor program where they can come in and help coach uh, kids who are less experienced than they are or younger kids. Uh, they earn points for National Honor Society and things like that. Since we now are, uh, as of 2013, no longer part of the music store, we are a nonprofit company of our own. Uh, so that gives us some flexibility with what we're doing. So we've, and not everybody who performs with us is going to go on and become a professional actor or performer. Some of them are just there to get experience or just there because they love performing. And we try to give as many opportunities as we can. My goal is to meet everybody where they are and help them achieve their goals. I was asked one time, I was given about 30 seconds to come up with a sentence for what we do. And what I came up with was we teach to the best of our ability so that our performers or so our participants can achieve to the best of theirs. And that's really the goal, whether it's the, the little boy who's too shy to speak in public and he goes through our Little Stars program and he's loving it and he's out there singing and acting and dancing in front of people and suddenly he just blossomed into something that no one anticipated he could be, um, to the kid who's like, oh, hey, I'm a sophomore in high school, I'm getting ready to be a junior, and I don't have a big enough resume to put on my um, college entrance papers. 
now what do I do? It's like, well, guess what? I'm doing 12 to 16 shows a year. Come be a part of that. You can mentor some, you can act in some. Let's see what we can do to help boost your resume so that you're more competitive with some of these kids who have been performing since they were four and five years old. So 12 to 16 shows a year, these, these aren't all musicals then, right? Or are you doing that many um, musicals? The large majority of them are musicals of some type. Uh, we have done some very major shows like Little Women the musical. Barnum, of course, is, that was pretty major. And people ask me if I was out of my mind over that one. And I said, absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we oh my goodness but we've also done some dramas we've done 12 angry jurors okay uh, we did the effect of gamma rays on man in the moon marigolds we oftentimes do collection of, of one act and we have had some student directors for some of those we've been very very successful with that um we do we divide our people into groups so we have our little stars who are kindergarten through maybe fourth grade, depending on what they need and what they're ready for. Um, after that, they can graduate into our center stage group, which is fifth grade through eighth grade. And then we have an upstage group, which is usually a musical. Uh, and that is um, ninth grade through adults. And we also have a main stage group, which uh, it could be almost anything. They do, um, semi-professional performances of things like, well, we have done a mall in the night visitors. Uh, this past season, they were working on Clue the musical, so, but they don't always do a musical. It could be anything. Uh, and then we recently developed uh, theater for young audiences, which is adults who perform for children. Uh, so those are the main theater groups that we have. Uh, and it's, they're just tons of fun. So I love going into these rehearsals in person uh, where we have all this energy coursing through and a hundred people running through the hallways and going to different rooms and doing their thing. Uh, and it's just amazing to see how much they grow and they learn. Um, and the people that we can really help. We had, I remember one time we were doing a um, production of Schoolhouse Rock Live and I had a kid, he was one of my personal students. I think I can tell this story because they wrote a testimonial about it for me, uh, where he came into my studio and he had really great singing voice. That he was, that's what he was there for. And he told me, he goes, well, I like theater. I'm like, well, that's great. Goes, but my teacher at school will only ever let me play the dead guy. So I get to be the dead body on stage. And I said, well, do you think you could do more than that? Would you like to do more than that? And he said, yeah, I would. And I said, well, you need to come and audition for a show with us. And I'm pretty sure you won't be a dead guy because I don't think we have any dead guys in the cast at the time. I said, but you have to do something for me. He had hair done to here, so I couldn't see his eyes. I said, I have to see your eyes. You're going to have to cut your hair. And he goes, I am never cutting my hair. I'm like, okay but I need to see your eyes somehow or another, never cutting my hair. So we went out and we talked to his mom and she goes, oh, he's never going to cut his hair. I will tell you that the next week he came in and I can see his eyes. He had cut his hair. Um, this kid was on the autism spectrum, which is why he had probably not been given very many opportunities. Mm -hmm. So he was cast in Schoolhouse Rock, which is a lovely show. I love that show. Just one of my favorites. And he did a fantastic job, totally came out of his shell, was able to make friends for the first time in his life who really allowed him to grow and participate and kind of shine with them. They encouraged him. And I remember his mother, oh, we probably shouldn't say this out loud, but his mother was taking a video during the show. <laughs> she wasn't, but I was watching her as she's holding the camera up, taking these videos and tears streaming down her face because she never thought this kid who was a sophomore in high school, would ever do anything like this, even though it had been his dream. And those are the moments I live for, and that I try to remember um, when, you know, because sometimes I get frustrated, right? And uh, it's like, oh, this is so much work. And then I remember things like that, and that's why we do what we do. That is awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, so you've got the opportunity to impact lives in a way that they might not have that chance for whether, you know, you mentioned 20% homeschoolers, they, they don't get to be in shows. 
Um, and, and then maybe if you go to a private school, it doesn't have the, the facilities for it. Or when I was in high school, we, we never did any musicals. It was all stage shows, which was fun. We great. And I got good experience, right. but it was not the same experience. Right. Well, musicals are very expensive to produce. And so I think that's why a lot of schools just really can't afford to have a program like that. And somehow or another, we make it work. Our, our focus is really on the actors, on the students, or, and, and the adults who are participating with us. And I've always had a little bit of a minimalist attitude toward things like sets and props and things like that. I really want the acting to shine. So that has allowed us to do more things than I think than I think we might otherwise have accomplished. Um, but we've done some very lavish things too. We did The Man Who Came to Dinner, uh, which we performed in a church sanctuary, but we built an entire house in that church sanctuary for that. Uh, it was, besides building all of the sets, the load-in took 18 hours. We were, there, we were there for two solid days without leaving, just you know, putting this thing together. Um, and it was a really fantastic set. I don't do that for every show because not every show needs that. Um, and well, that, you, you've got to have like a set person too, because you can't just put that together overnight. No, it takes it takes some uh, coordinating. It does take some coordinating. What? Um, so where are you performing? Is it? Is it? I know we've been to performances at churches, and then you've, you. There's also a small stage in the back of Zingo Music that you've used. Is, are those the same places you're using now? Um, well, we do a lot of things at churches. So right now, uh, we're, well, right now we're all virtual. So who knows where we are? <laughs> <laughs> so I gave a lesson the other day to people in West Virginia. And I'm like, well, I've never taught in West Virginia before. This is interesting. But I'm sitting right here in my house doing that. Um, we actually do our rehearsals in the basement at Sunrise Methodist Church, which is in O'Fallon. We do sometimes perform there in their facility. Willot Road Community Church has been very kind mm -hmm. to us. The Fallon Church of Christ has been very kind to us uh, to, you know, they've just opened their doors. We have a few other churches in town where we perform. Uh, we've done performing in restaurants and things like that. So, what restaurants? Um, the Village Cafe is one where we've, we have done a few performances. We did a whole bunch of one act shows there. Um, so that was fun with people eating in the kitchen going. And I don't know, it was kind of crazy, but I'll try anything at least once. I think theater can happen anywhere. Absolutely. Just ask small children when they pitch a fit. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And we've done performances outside. We've performed at um, the O'Day Park Amphitheater here in... I guess that's I guess that's O'Fallon. Yeah, I think so. And so, just lots and lots of fun places. Uh, we have a um, an improv troupe who's wonderful, and they perform all over town, wherever they can be. Um, so yeah, just a lot of things going on. And everything you do is on a, everything is on a volunteer basis, right? You don't have any paid employees, or or we do. Uh, oh, we okay. Do have some paid employees. Because we've grown with all this, you know, I really feel that for the most part, artists tend to be underpaid. If I had a dollar for, any, for, for every time somebody said to me, oh, would you do this for me? And, you know, you'll get great exposure. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't need any more exposure. I have to put food on my table. So my goal is for these, uh, the young artists I have, it used to be that I directed just about everything myself um, because it was cheaper that way. I don't have to pay myself. Uh, but now we have, we have five or six directors who work for us on a regular basis. A lot of the things they do are volunteer, but I do like to give them something because their time and their expertise is valuable. So we just feel like we want to do that. Um, and that was part of the reason for us to become a nonprofit is that we now can take um, uh, donations and we can write for grants and things like that. And that helps us pay these people while keeping any of the fees that we would pass on to students very affordable. And I always say money should never be an issue to participate with us. If you cannot afford to participate with us, talk to me because we want people who wanna be there and who want to learn 
and who want to perform and be part of a dynamic, fantastic group of people. Um, and there are other things that are important besides money. Uh, so sometimes I'll say, hey, would you come in and work backstage for a show? Would you help do hair and makeup? Would you help sew a costume? Uh, and so there are other ways for them to participate and, and really still pay for what they're, you know, for their experience, if that's what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do try to give our, our professional directors a stipend of some sort for each show they're directing. Because it takes a lot of time and effort uh, for them to do that. Right. Let me ask you, so, you know, in a traditional theater setting, like, when you go to see a show, you're familiar with, you're the house, you're sitting in the house and the stage mm -hmm. is up there, but you've got sets, you know, you've got, you got the sets built up, walls of a house or whatever it is, stairs, anything, you've got windows, um, you got costumes and people don't think about it, but those are usually stored like within the bowels of the theater, right? Like there's a basement yes. <laughs> and almost all of them have a basement. They just throw the stuff down there right. and you, you pull out a flat and you repaint it. It's, it's it's a wall with a window and one show and the next show it's a forest, you know, and that's right. <laughs> um, so what, where do you put all that stuff? <laughs> well, much to my husband's chagrin. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I will say a lot of that is now in my house. So um, we're fortunate that we have um, part of our basement is a music studio for my kids. So my kids are, my children are very musical. Uh, but we have a space that is dedicated toward hanging costumes. And I have another space that is for props. Uh, so they're all very organized. He's going to tell you they're not, but they sort of are. Um, no, they're all very organized. And uh, we keep track of them that way because we're at that point now where we actually can loan out things to other organizations if they need it. Uh, and I always like to tell people, I can't park in my garage because there's a pirate ship in there. <laughs> I hate when that happens. I know. <laughs> but you know, it's such a cool thing to be able to say, isn't it? So, yeah. Is that from uh, Pirates of Penzance or what was that from? Um, that, I, well, I'm a little pirate happy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we did a show called The Lady Pirates of Captain Bree. Okay. So our initial pirate experience. Uh, but I also have a show that we pull up every once in a while and it's part of our theater for young audiences and it's called how to become a pirate in seven easy songs so pieces of that pirate ship do make it do make their way into other shows okay i mean you could do pirates but you could do peter pan or you know all these we pirate could shows do peter pan actually peter pan was the first show i ever did me too really? sorry go ahead yeah that is amazing i played michael so did i oh that is so <laughs> that is really cool I was, yeah, so I was, um, I was in seventh grade and I was so small, you know, they, all, they always want the, you always want the older kid that's smaller because, right. you know, they can, they're a little bit easier to control than, you know, an you actual, than a four-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so I was at, it was at Lindenwood and they were doing Peter Pan and I remember the whole thing because I had a teddy bear and I got to fly Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, they yes. had this big crane. They'd hook it. I, I wore a, I think I only flew like in the first act when, the, when you're in the nursery, right? And so right. it's like a, a parachute harness on. Sure. And to fly, you would just run to a corner of the stage and you lean back and they'd hook, you, hook it into your parachute harness and you were leaned back so that the, the cable would just go back with you. Yes. So when they pulled it up, you'd just go this way and they yes. come back here and land and they take the thing off of you. Yes. And you know, I would not do that today. <laughs> did you do it? You did it too though, right? I did. I, I did in that one. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about it because I was literally four years old. But a couple of things I do remember about that show that was done in Cincinnati. And um, for some reason, Mary Martin, who played Peter Pan, was very famous for playing Peter Pan, was in town. She was doing, I think she was doing the show I Do, I Do. Again, I was four, I don't remember, but I think it was I do, I do. And she wrote us a telegram. She sent us a telegram um, wishing us the best for our production and love and hugs from her or from Peter Pan in Neverland and from her right there in Cincinnati. It read something like that. Uh, and so that was just, obviously that's the part of the experience I never forgot. 
uh, but I still teach that show and I was able to revisit the show when I was 15 and play Peter. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So, and so it's one of my favorite shows. Yeah. And for those who don't know, it's, it's kind of a tradition that a, a younger woman plays Peter Pan because he's, uh, however old he's supposed to be, but he never grows up. So he never grows up. Yeah. yeah. So you always have that the lighter voice and the yes, absolutely. I don't think they adhere to that so much anymore. Uh, but that is what James M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan, said that he wanted yeah. to have happen. And even you know later, now is able to be a music director for another theater company on Peter and the Starcatcher, of which that one. a spinoff of Peter Pan. Uh, that same story. And then I was able to take uh, quite a few of my students to see Finding Neverland at the Fox a few years ago, um, which is another Peter, how the story of Peter Pan came to be. Mm -hmm. So now we've amassed all these Peter Pan stories. <laughs> it's such a great story. It's like the Christmas, uh, Christmas Carol, you know, you, you retell it over and over and over again, just right. in a slightly different way. So. Absolutely. So do you have like a whole, I, I'm going to go back to the stuff in your basement Okay. <laughs> so, like, I picture a costume shop and a prop shop. I mean, you have to have, like, a whole, an entire basement for those kinds of things. So, do you have, like, period pieces? So, like, by period pieces, yeah. you mean, like, Renaissance clothing, um, stuff that you could do Shakespeare, clothing you could do Shakespeare with, yes. and, and then you've got, like, baseball uniforms and, I mean, all, all that of kind that. of stuff. All Pir of that. Pirate costumes, clearly. Um, Absolutely, pirate costumes. Uh, if you walk into my basement, it looks like a regular, you know, kind of a finished basement until you go through a door to the right. And then it's, it's a fairly large room and it has costumes hanging on double levels all the way across. And then we have freestanding garment racks that we can pull in and out. So it's actually packed in there pretty tightly. But I, I know where just about everything is. We're in the process of cataloging everything uh, at this point. So that, you know, if we do lend something out, we know that we want it to come back. Um, we finished a production of Little House on the Prairie, the musical, which was a huge production. We had 46 characters on stage. Um, and with all those period costumes from, you know, the mid 1800s. Uh, and I still have all of those. We dry clean them and we hang them back up. Um, so, and then, my favorite thing to do, we have a, a wonderful lady named Gail Whitehouse who designed many of the costumes that we have. Uh, and so one of the things I, I like to do is say, hey, you know what, can we do these in, in layers and pieces so that I can take the skirt from one costume and put it with the top of another costume and create a whole different look. So she's super good with that. Uh, so that's been very versatile. Um, sometimes we do other things where we'll have a character portrayed by a puppet. So one of my former students, Matthew Batzel, um, had worked uh, with one of the guys who uh, does Muppets in New York. Okay. And so he has made me quite a few uh, puppet costume things. We did uh, Alice in Wonderland was one of the shows that we, uh, well, we've done it a couple of times. And in Alice in Wonderland Jr., this is a junior show, uh, the Cheshire Cat is played by three people. Uh, so they're narrators, basically, of the show, but there are three of them. And we had them all dressed in black, but I wanted this puppet to be able to split into three parts so that the body could flip around, the head could flip around, and then the tail could also flip around. So he, Matthew built me a Cheshire Cat, that could come apart and come back together. And so we were able to choreograph the three narrators as the Cheshire Cat and have the, you know how in the um, cartoon movie, the head can kind of turn around and sometimes it disappears. Uh, so we were able to affect that on stage in a middle school production. That's awesome. It, it was awesome and I just feel so blessed to, have made contact with people like that. It's just like they pop into my life and it's like, wow, you know what? Can we, you know, can we do this? And he was able to get these materials. I have a Humpty Dumpty judge that he made for me that we used in Babes in Toyland, the Cheshire Cat, of course. I have, this is actually an amazing story, but I have a, a crow that looks like a Muppet puppet 
that we used in a show called Aesop's Fabulous Barnyard Bash. And one of my favorite stories, my daughter did this to me. <laughs> <laughs> that we did our first show with that puppet. And when we were packing up to, to leave and get everything back to the, to the shop, she stuck that crow in the back window of my car <laughs> and I had to drive home with that crow sticking out there in the back window of my car and a police officer following me all the way home. <laughs> because of a crow? <laughs> I don't know. He just happened to be going that way. I've had a couple of interesting experiences with the crow. Theater is just a, a, it's a great thing. <laughs> So how many people do you um, have floating around there? I mean, you don't have like a specific group, but you've, if you're doing, you're probably putting together three, four shows at a time, right? It's from the sounds of things. Oh yeah, absolutely. So how many, how many kids and adults do you have at any given time working on those shows? You know, it really depends on uh, the size of the cast for each show. So if I were to go back Last, the last term was kind of weird because we got usurped by COVID-19. This has happened to a lot of performing arts organization. Um, but if we were to go back to the previous term, we actually had our Little Star show, uh, which I, I don't even remember what it was right now. Uh, we had a center stage show. Our Little Stars probably had about 12 or 14 kids in it. Our center stage had, usually has about 26. And on occasion, we'll have into the 40s. So sometimes we split that into two different shows. I don't double cast shows. I won't have like a cast A and a cast B. If we get to that point where we have that many people, and I will say we just have so much talent coming to us, I'll actually add a whole different show with another director and we'll do two separate shows. Um, our upstage cast probably had about 15 people in it. And then we had a main stage cast that I think was 12 or 13 people. So that's how many people we might have there. And then we might have a choir that it has between 12 and 20 people in it. Uh, I call them vocal ensembles rather than choir usually. Um, and then our dance classes. So we may have on any given evening, 100 people running through and that's not counting um, directors, assistant directors, costume mm -hmm. people, you know, whoever else might be running there. And I always have um, a front desk staff uh, they are there at all times. I feel really, really strongly that we always, when we're dealing with kids, have two adults in the room with them um, so that everybody feels confident that right. everybody's looked after well. Um, with our little stars, I like to have one, well, I have the two adults in the room at least, and then we have student mentors because some of those kids are so little they can't really read yet. And some of them have trouble sitting still or holding still. So I try to have at least one grown up type person, whether it's a high school student, you know, along with the two adults or whether it's several adults, but probably one adult type person for every three children in the group. And sometimes that group's been big. Sometimes it's had 20 people in it. Um, so we do, we, we're quite sizable in that respect. Can you tell me a little bit more about the mentor program? Sure. Um, a lot of times people come to us and they're like, well, we had one young lady who just graduated from high school. Her goal is, has been to go to college to major in theater education. And she wants to work with kids. So I said, well, you know, you're doing this show with us right now. Why don't you come and mentor with Little Stars? And she's done that for several terms. And it's grown to the point where uh, she actually will do some of the choreography for us, for that group. And she's been able to take on some directorial responsibility. So if we're working with lines with kids, she can take a little group in the corner and work with lines. Um, and that actually, she got some phenomenal scholarships to go to Missouri State to major in uh, theater education this coming fall. Uh, she largely in part to her experience with us because she was able to hand hand them uh, at International Thespian Society programs from all of the shows she's done with us, all the things she's worked on. Uh, she directed a couple of one acts for us over the past year or so. And uh, so it's just a great experience and it, it is helpful to them, I believe. Yeah, I didn't direct a show until I was a junior in college, I don't think, or maybe even a senior. Um, so just not an opportunity that most 
kids get at any point. It's, it's not. I know some of the schools do that too. And that's, you know, the other thing that I was going to say about school theater, they still have to work within the confines of the school. And so while they can have large casts and accommodate a lot of people, we generally find that most kids don't have the opportunity to do meaty roles. And, you know, they're going to be that, that group of kids that always seems to get the really good roles. And then other kids who, who really don't, and there may be some kids who really want to try a big role, but they just don't get that opportunity. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we can do, that's just not so feasible for schools to be able to do all the time. So, so we like to come alongside and, and work. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, so uh, my son was with you for a long time for voice and piano. He did, he did one show really wasn't his bailiwick, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he's, he's at in college. He has a music uh, voice scholarship in college. Mm -hmm. How, sounds like you're great. And I remember you at least graduating one other kid that went to either Missouri state or Southeast Missouri state for, on a, for a musical theater uh, scholarship. Yes. So how, how much of that is going on for your kids? I think there's a lot of it that's going on. I want to say, well, I really haven't thought about it in a little while, uh, but from MCCA, we've had probably 14 kids uh, in the nine or 10 years we've been going. Uh, we've had about 14 kids get scholarships to major universities in music or theater, dance, that sort of thing. Personally, from my studio, um, I've probably had over 45 or 50 kids. And that's in nine years. Well, that's my career has been longer than nine years. <laughs> oh, oh, your studio overall. My studio overall. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, but even those who don't, I've had some who, like I have a young lady who went into special education, but she got a music minor. So you know, there's a lot of that that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes it's just the joy of music or just the, the fact that you learn how to problem solve through music or you can use that in other ways or just for their own enjoyment. Yeah. I think that's important. So if somebody wanted to get a hold of MCC or get involved, what's, how can they do that? Well, there are a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, one way is that you can email me through a website and our website is www.midwestcca.org. I'm going to put that up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you can go to there and there's like a contact page or something on there. There's a contact page. There's tons of ways to get in touch. Okay. Uh, people can call me, but my, the phone number is up there, but you can call or text. Uh, and that's 636-459-0038. Okay. Uh, email is info at midwestcca.org. Great. Is there anything that I, uh, I didn't ask you about or that you, you wanted to cover or talk about that I didn't, uh, that we didn't get to? Um, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. I know it has, was always my joy to teach your son. He was a fantastic student for me and a beautiful voice. I loved working with that voice. And I do remember him. He played the piano. So he was a piano student of mine also. And uh, I remember he liked the Beatles a lot. <laughs> we have that in common. I, I kind of pass that on to him, that love of the Beatles. It's really mm -hmm. part of who I am in, in reality. Right. Um, yeah, he got his mother's voice. So that's a good thing. <laughs> he, got, he got my looks. Facebook, whatever a picture of him posts on Facebook, it tells me there's a picture of me out there. And I'm like, oh. It's... Well, you do resemble one another. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, Wendy Dickin, thanks for spending some time. And... We'll definitely put up these the the uh, website and the. Uh, do you want me to put your phone number up here? Like you want that out there? Or? They can find that on the. They can find that on the website yeah, too. We'll, we'll go with the website, and <laughs> and I've certainly got my own email out there. And I'm just gonna. I'll I'll say it again here at the end. I, if you know somebody that's got a story or is running a, a a great organization like this that that's unique and you don't see a lot of, I'd love to sit down and have a conversation with them. And, and let them get a pitch in there for it uh, during the conversation. So anybody <laughs> like that? Set, Make a comment below. Uh, you can email us at regularamazingpeople at gmail.com. And Wendy Dickin, again, thanks for your time, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it very much. All right.